Steve Tate is Canadian born, uh, was also educated in Canada. Unfortunately, it was the University of British Columbia. <laughs> but, you know, being a, a Westerner, they tend to look towards these Western schools. He started working in banking in 1985. And then when the bank that he was working with was taken over by HSBC, he became a career banker with HSBC. And during that time, he had the opportunity to work in Canada. And he was transferred over to London as head of human resources there, and then moved back to Canada again in 1998 to take over the operation of the British Columbia Bank. And in 1999, he made the career-changing decision of moving to Hong Kong and took over head of human resources for HSBC for Asia. It was an enormous job, and uh, Steve graduated from that job <laughs> in 2008 and set up his own company called Take Human Capital. And in that role, he's had the opportunity to work with some of the most distinguished companies in Asia. He's also qualified as a, co a coach and works in a lot of coaching with major organizations. And I think the combination of a 35-year um, banking career, looking specifically around human resources, and then moving into the coaching field with really focusing education around it as well, to become a certified coach and to become a, an individual that can work with any sort of organization, makes him just one of the most special people I have ever known and one of the most delightful people to work with. I've had the opportunity to work with um, Steve during the seven years that I have been here because we served on the Canadian Chamber of Commerce on the Board of Governors together. At one time, we were both on the uh, Board of Governors of the Canadian International School. Uh, Steve has continued with that and is Vice Chair of the Canadian International School. And he also serves on the Board of Quam, a publicly traded company here in Hong Kong. So he's got all the experience in the world, and I don't want to take one more second. So over to you, Steve. Goodness gracious. <laughs> <laughs> so old. <laughs> I know. Yeah, the good thing is that I'm older, right? <laughs> yeah, I was just waiting for that. <laughs> yeah, the bit you missed out is that I, I actually started in banking in 1974 with the Toronto Dominion Bank, so oh. it's a, it goes back a good long time. My God, you are older. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, as, as Kathleen said, when I, uh, when I retired from the bank, which is indeed what I did in 2008, I. Um, I was one of those people who was fortunate enough to um, have had an opportunity to have a career that spanned really an amazing period of growth for an organization, that being HSBC. Um, you know, it's, it's been said that rising tides float all boats, and, uh, and I was fortunate to be one of those boats over 25 years that it just got bigger and bigger. Uh, when I joined the company, uh, quite by accident, I should say, through an acquisition, which happens more and more frequently these days. Uh, how people come to join. Um, the company had, was in about 10 countries and it had roughly 30,000 employees. And when I retired, uh, we were in 87 countries with 330,000 employees. So it was an incredible growth story through all of that and, uh, and I was fortunate enough to be part of the ride. Um, what we're going to talk about today are maybe some, a few insights into um, some things I learned along the way. A little bit of what I'm learning about now. Uh, working with companies other than HSBC, because folks get, get tired of that story too. Um, and, uh, and I'll talk a little bit about what specifically employers are looking for when they assess people, when they, when they assess talent. I've got, I've got quite a bit of data on that in that respect. Uh, what I thought I'd start off though is a, is a little bit of current reality. This is where we are today. Uh, there was a Hudson report which comes out uh, quarterly that talks about employment opportunities uh, for the next three months looking forward. Um, the one for April through uh, June is what we're going to refer to here. There were 1,600 key decision makers who were asked their views on whether or not they were more optimistic for the next three months about opportunities coming along than the last three months. And interestingly, what, they, what they're finding now, of course, in this part of the world is that there's a lot of optimism. Um, in fact, in China, you can see that 64% of, uh, of employers are thinking they're going to have more jobs come on stream over the next three months than in the last three months. Hong Kong, not quite so optimistic, but still pretty good. 59% and 54% for Singapore. Here's how it tracks over time, which is, which is quite interesting. We're actually reaching the highs, if you, if you take a look at this, back to when it was um, previously at, at this level. It was in September, two, July to September 2007. Anybody remember what happened right about then? 
Exactly. So while we can be very optimistic right now, we shouldn't, uh, we shouldn't assume that that graph continues in a positive slope. But I find that quite interesting as, a, as an indicator of what employers are thinking uh, at this point in time. There's a lot of optimism out there. Interestingly, if you want to, uh, if you want to leave a job, uh, you want to leave it in, in China because the chances of getting a, a, a counter offer to stay are very high now. And that's the whole piece around the, the supply-demand mismatch which we have in the labor force uh, today. Less frequently will you get your employer to give you a counter offer in Hong Kong, but still, still fairly often, two-thirds of the time, they'll trump up with more money if you walk in with a, with a resignation letter in this marketplace today and you're in a, uh, an area that has uh, a supply shortage. And Singapore a little bit less again. Interestingly, where do these counteroffers go? They're not just slapped down as, as signing bonuses or anything of that nature. They're actually now moved back to um, putting it on the base salary. Remember the good old days when people were saying, put less on base, let's give more incentives? It's all about the labor mismatch here. And people are looking now for more money to be put on base salaries because they want to cash flow uh, more, more readily. And which is, which is actually becoming quite a, a, a dynamic in the marketplace. And you can't any longer assume that you can do once a year pay adjustments and think that's going to see you through the piece. Unless you have a culture which says that's what we do around here, there's some companies that do that, and we're going to give you this big bonus later on, and we have a history of doing that. So there's a belief in that, in that happening. Although we are seeing all this optimism, interestingly it's not translating into huge increases in employee morale. So I think the message here for me is that people are working hard. Uh, here and, and they're, they're not getting that work-life balance necessarily. It's feeling a little bit better because I'm feeling a little bit more secure in my role, but it's not lifting me to the point of feeling like I'm uh, you know, in, in a nirvana state here right now. And lastly, um, how to find a job if you're, if you're looking in the market right now. A lot of people are still going to, uh, to recruitment consultancies for that purpose. Certainly in Singapore, that's the, the preferred way of looking for, for jobs. Um, in China, less so. China has more in-house recruiters, interestingly. So if you're looking for a job, you want to find it in China, chances are you'll, you'll have more luck by going to an in-house recruiter um, and, uh, and searching that way. Just some interesting data I thought would maybe set a backdrop for you about the marketplace that you're now finding yourselves in when you're looking for employment opportunities. There's a piece of work done in uh, 2003 by Harvard, and they took a look at what it is that employees uh, look for when they want to become engaged in their, their, uh, with their employment uh, opportunities. And engaged for this purpose means three things. It's what do you say about the company when you're not among a group of colleagues or peers inside. So when you're at the dinner table or when you're in a social setting or when you're on the football pitch, what are you actually saying about the place that you're working at? It's what's your intention to stay? In other words, are you intending to leave over the next three months or are you intending to leave longer term? And what's your, your intention to strive? So am I going to do something that's going to take this company through a tremendous growth pattern or not? And there's companies around that, that measure all of this stuff. Um, Hewitt's is one, and I'll refer to a bit of Hewitt data here in a moment. But what the Harvard people found was that the bit that really engages people is this whole notion of personal growth. It's the bit about feeling that you're achieving something and are being recognized for doing something personally and individually. Um, the bit that really turns people off, and as we get global, uh, it, it, it happens more and more frequently, is this whole element of bureaucracy and policy. And I can tell you, having joined a company that was 10 countries and 30,000 people, boy did we make decisions. In fact, our motto internally was fast decisions worldwide. It was so well known that we even had a junk out here named Fast Decisions. Now when I left, that wasn't actually the sense that I got on some decisions that, that had to be made. Because we had this, this whole corporate overlay which said, you know, does it align with, with standardized best practice and so on and so forth. And so that, that whole sense of, of being able to determine what it was you wanted and to your, the decisions you wanted to make was being uh, sort of leaking out of the company. As, as we got bigger and bigger. And whenever I say this to, to people around the room in companies and workshops that I might run, I get this big nodding of heads. You know, this, this sure feels like my company now. It just gets harder and harder to, to get decisions done as you get bigger. The other interesting thing that came out of it was quality of supervision. And uh, it's often been said that people leave bosses, not companies. 
Um, the Harvard research would bear that out. They would bear out the fact that either, in, in, in my view, my boss is incompetent, or our chemistry just isn't just doesn't fit. Okay, we don't we don't we're not cut from the same bowl. And so that's another disengaging factor for people as they as they look at their employment prospects. Salary is an interesting one. It sits down here as a hygiene factor, neither necessarily positive nor necessarily negative. It will become a, other than that if you uh, if you of course aren't in the market, uh, you find that you're paying below market. Then of course that's going to become a major dissatisfier, and but people will vote with their feet quickly on that one. Uh, in the marketplace we just talked about in China and so forth you're going to see um, like pay adjustments uh, rising more rapidly because the, the dynamics of the market uh, necessitate that. <coughs> so what do employers need then? Well, there's a, a bunch of research that was done by the Hewitt uh, uh, organization, Hewitt, uh, Human Resource Consultants, here in Hong Kong. So this is Hong Kong related data. Uh, it was actually run in 2008, published in 2009. They're getting ready to run their next best employer survey. You'll see up here in just a moment that I'll, there's two categories. There's the best and the rest. There were something like 800 employers that, that were part of this survey that Hewitt's ran in 2008. Um, and of those, two, of those 800, there were six, only six, that were designated as the best. And these were companies that were deemed to have the highest engagement scores of all who were in the survey sample. Hewitt's also tried to do something which I thought was quite innovative and, and, and very uh, appropriate, and that is they tried to make a connection between uh, return on invested capital for the best as opposed to return on invested capital for the rest. In other words, if you could pull one lever as a CEO, what, what would you get in terms of your human capital? And they cal calibrated that to be something in the neighborhood of 20 plus percent. Uh, an additional return on invested capital for those companies that were deemed to be in the best category as opposed to the rest. So what were the best doing that the rest weren't? Well, interestingly, in the best, they were setting way more aggressive goals uh, than, the, than the rest were. And so this, this whole notion of being given clarity of goals and goals that were stretching was actually something that was quite engaging for employees. We did some research around this at the bank uh, way back then, and we found exactly the same thing that employees who have clear goals and stretching goals tend to be more engaged employees. So one thing that you might think about when you're thinking about trying to make it to the top is getting real clear on what are those goals that you need to, to, to uh, strive towards. Uh, interestingly, a significant portion of people manager rewards are based on their capability to develop their people. So the Hewitt survey found that actually those companies that embed in the KPIs of their managers this challenge around developing people, interestingly, became the best of employers. 83% versus 70% of the number of this one. And for those who are, who are deemed to be in the best category, the, 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 the leader actually deflects the, 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 the ownership, if you will, of the success of the company. Uh, for four or five years, I reported to David Eldon, many, many of you will have heard of or perhaps know David. He's a, he's a wonderful man. I thoroughly enjoyed working with him. And every time that our results came out, unfortunately for him, they were always higher the, 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 the next quarter than the previous one during his period of time. He would always say something to the effect of, you know, I stand on the shoulders of giants. This is easy for me because I have a great team below me. And it was this whole piece of, of you know, the success of the team was bigger than his own personal success. He just deflected all of that back. And I can tell you internally, it made a big difference for us about how, how, how valued we felt as a, as a group. Uh, the manager takes time to, to devote to his people. The best do it way more often than, than do the rest. And uh, interest, this is a really interesting one, I find. <laughs> because the best of employers actually give away highest performance ratings less often than do the rest. Now, you could argue that that's a bit illogical. You know, if you're the best and you've got higher, higher uh, overall company performance, you should therefore be giving higher performance ratings. But let me give you a true story. And Kathleen said, and it's absolutely true, in 1986, I was with the Bank of British Columbia. I joined that bank in 1981, and, and over the period of that five years, my colleagues and I drove that company into the ground to the point at which the Canadian government came along in 86 and said, we'll sell this company for a single Canadian dollar to the Hong Kong Shanghai Bank and I was one of 2,000 employees in, H in, in, in the Bank of British Columbia at the time, which meant I was worth one two thousandth of one dollar. <laughs> Not a lot at that point in time. 
So as a, and my job at the time was, I was the, the, the resourcing guy. So I was the one who <coughs> recruited people. I was the one who placed them in the company. I was the one who tried to you know, sell them on the notion of a career in a company. Ever tried to sell someone on the notion of a career in a company when the company's failing? <laughs> this is a major challenge. And I, I was right there at the, at the full face of all this. And so people would come to me and they'd say, well, you know, can I have uh, more money? And I said, well, actually, no, we don't have any more money. And they'd say, what about a career I promise? And I said, well, you know, can't really promise a career either. So, I, well, what can you give me? So what we ended up doing was giving away the discipline on our performance management system. We rated everybody, or not everybody, we rated many, many people very, very highly. More highly than they probably deserved. The number was something like 30% of our employees at the point at which we failed were actually rated highly at, at that number one rating. So HSBC came in and they said, look, we got this great distribution system. We got it for a single dollar. We got 30% of the employees are, are outstanding. We, we, it's a steal. Until they started to peel the onion and they realized that that 30% number was actually a bit of a charade. And, and what had happened is we'd given away our discipline. We lost it all. The message here is that the best of employers don't actually give away the discipline. They hang on to it. And, they, and, and any, as my old grandmother used to say, anything rare is valuable. And the best of employers, that's the truth. A lot of people struggle with this, actually. A lot of companies have real issues with this. Is there also an element of team versus individual in that? In, in the, 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 late look, the percentage is lower of leading performers as individuals rather than this recognizing was, This is on individual uh, ratings, yeah, yeah. The challenge that companies have, and I was dealing with one yesterday, is how do you take a system that doesn't have its discipline and, and instill it without turning everybody off? And it's a real issue because you end up saying, okay, in, in, in HSBC's case, you know, it was 20, 70, 10. That was the distribution, 20, 1 and 2 ratings, 70 percent, 3 ratings, 4 and 5 ratings, 10 percent of the people, 20, 70, 10. And we went from that in one year, from to that in one year, from something that was, you know, much more liberal previously. And that year of transition was a year of, a real difficulty internally in terms of kind of digesting this discipline that we've done, that we can still. I do a bit of work with another company called Human Scope. Uh, Human Scope is a small HR consulting firm here. A couple of years ago, actually it was five years ago now, they did some research on um, uh, the capabilities that companies are looking for in senior managers, people that they would see that would get to the top. Uh, it took them a couple of years to complete this research. Um, specifically what they asked was, what do companies look for in leaders? And how do companies define executive success? And what they then did is they, they also looked at some academic models, and then they sort of mapped all of that one across the other. It was a, it was a great big study that they did, because their business is actually uh, running assessment and development centers for companies. So they wanted to get clear on what are the capabilities that the best of employers and the best of companies are looking for in trying to grow their people. What they found, interestingly, was that there was a significant overlap across companies. The 60 to 70 percent of the competencies that were shown, that, that, that they identified, and which I'll show in a moment here, were common across all companies. So when you talk about what does it take to get to the top, this is about a good, as good an answer as you're going to find around the, the characteristics, the attributes and the competencies that the best employers are now looking for. It's a rather messy slide. I'm not going to hang on this one too long, other than to say human scope group these character these competencies into four dimensions. Entrepreneurial, that is their their outside the box thinking, their the change innovation, their execution capability, that's their technical expertise and the drive for quality standards and, and execution and result orientation. Their interpersonal skills, remember we talked about both employers and, and how the people management side of that is so critical. What they found in, in the human scope, scope study found that leadership, building relationships, and adapting were all very important attributes in, in organizations and, and individual success. And then the, what they call the intrapersonal capabilities, these had to do with things like integrity, resilience, personal drive, and ambition. I'm just going to hang on each one of those for a moment. Visionary and strategic thinking is one of the capabilities that Cumanscope identified when it came to their, uh, their entrepreneurial component. True story, 1989, there was a fellow by the name of Jim Clean, 
And Jim Cleave was the CEO of HSBC in Canada. Um, brilliant guy, actually. He was my boss for three or four years. Uh, Jim, after his time in Canada, went on to become the CEO of Marine Midland Bank, which has since become HSBC Bank USA. Um, he, uh, he phoned me one day. We were going to have an off-site in Whistler. He phoned me one day and he said, uh, Steve, I need a ride to Whistler. We're at, uh, where I'm in Vancouver. He said, uh, can you drive me out there? How often does a CEO phone you and say, can, can you give me a lift? Not often. So I, I checked my insurance, um, gassed up my Honda, uh, and uh, picked him up in the front of the building and away we drove. I had three hours with Jim Cleave. One on one for that period of time. We stopped, true, we stopped in Squamish for a hamburger at McDonald's. Uh, got to Whistler, we had our two day offsite, came back to, to Vancouver, and we're driving down, this, down the street, and we're about to turn the corner from Hornby onto Georgia Street as we just about uh, head back to the bank building. And he said, You know, I was in London uh, about a month ago, and um, I had this discussion with, uh, with a couple of people that, that I worked with there, John Bond and uh, Willie Purvis. And uh, they have this vision, this is 1989, that um, over the next 10 to 15 years, the financial services industry will integrate to a point to which there will be five or six major players in the world. And this is a point where there were all kinds of you know, little banks and big banks dotted all over the place. They have this view that the world is going to somehow come together in its integration of financial services. And their vision is that we will be one of those five. That was 1989. Turning a corner in a Honda Accord, Jim Cleave tells me this grand vision has been sort of percolating in, in London. And he's now getting to the point where he's starting to test the idea to see, to see if, it's, if it's going to germinate. So visionary and strategic thinking. It wasn't Jim, it was, it was, it was John and, and Willie Purvis who were the ones who, who were sort of getting this kernel of thought in mind. But it was that which started to move the company from its 10 countries to its 87 countries some you know, 25 years later, all start somewhere. There's a great change orientation. You know, in order to do that, to make that big move in 1993, the group had to do something bold. And that something bold was to move its headquarters from Hong Kong to London. So when you think about the careers that you might move into, particularly at this point of tremendous change and opportunity that's out there, you're going to at some point be faced with this dilemma around doing something bold. That whole change orientation and the ability to, to create the, the belief that you can move this whole ship forward in a slightly different direction. Moving this company's headquarters from, from Hong Kong in 1993, the run up to 1997, that was the sort of political backdrop, to London to buy a major clearing bank in the UK was a big deal. It, it took all kinds of political maneuverings, the Bank of England on the other side, and the regulatory authorities, HPMA here, all of those folks had to get involved in this whole situation, let alone the whole movement of people to, to London. So it's that kind of thinking that takes people to the top when they think about needing to do something that's really transformational. It's this tremendous change orientation. And we're seeing it today. You know, there's a great company here in Hong Kong, Liam Fung. It was started off as a kernel of a company, you know, 20 to 30 years ago. Um, the Fung brothers, William and Victor, sort of inherited the company from their father. And through their, you know, intellectual sort of perspective and, and visionary capability, have transformed that company to be the world's largest you know, trade uh, firm, trade supplier. Great change orientation. The little steps they've done to create that have been uh, worth studying in and of themselves. How do you finally get to the point where you're uh, getting a contract worth $2 billion a year from Walmart from having been a little kernel of a trading company in, uh, in Hong Kong is, is, is an amazing story. Something else on the entrepreneurial side is uh, this commercial judgment and business decision making. Now, I would like to say that HSBC got it all right, but in fact, we didn't. Um, and we made, a, we made a big blunder, actually. And, and this was on the basis, the basis of commercial judgment. Uh, we made an assumption that we needed to be big in the U.S. to be a major personal financial services player. And uh, probably the thinking was right, but what underpinned, it, what underpinned that was not a deep enough analysis on, on why was personal financial services as a segment growing so rapidly there. You know, we've learned a lot of lessons. As you do. HSBC has learned a lot of lessons since then because we didn't really get to the kernel of it, which was money was cheap. 
the money was cheaper than it should have been, and that's what was underpinning that whole growth in the, the household finance company, which we bought, um, and have since written the whole thing off. So, um, you know, you don't always get it right. You've got to, you've got to try, you've got to get up there, you're going to make some mistakes, but you have to learn by those mistakes and, and move forward with it. Great leaders do that. The whole execution piece is interesting. You know, it, it, it's often, you often see people come into the workforce out of the university and so forth, and they think that they can go right to the top right away. Um, they don't realize that, in fact, you have to understand the business of the business to be able to qualify to, to lead it at some future point. So cutting your teeth, getting your expertise and your knowledge level up is, is absolutely critical. It sounds logical, but a lot of people assume uh, otherwise. There's a drive for quality and standards, which is now across the piece in terms of execution uh, in these uh, best companies. So there's a willingness not to just say that good enough is good enough in these great companies. There's a willingness to continue to, to you know, as I call, buff the David. I mean, just you chipped it out. You've got it free, but you've got to really get it home to the point where it's an absolute perfection. And the, in, in those executives that, drive, that, uh, that get to the top, they have, in many cases, this obsession with detail and getting that standard quality uh, to an extraordinarily high level. Execution and result orientation, needless to say, I mean, we live in a world where quarterly results are, are sort of the, the way we operate, be it good or otherwise. And, uh, and the best of, it, of uh, leaders get themselves into this whole area of being able to execute uh, with, with perfection. I'm dealing with a company right now who's had some real issues on the execution side. They've been able to sort of mask their financial uh, side because they, they have, there's lots of elasticity in their pricing. So they've added more and more uh, margin, but it's now coming at a social cost to that organization. Uh, what they've lost is, is some perspective of this, of this execution and the balance that's necessary to get that whole piece right. They, and in so doing, they're losing their constituents. Interpersonal skill, leadership. We've talked so much uh, earlier about leadership and the, and the dynamic that this, uh, that this uh, it creates within a company. But you know, you, to, to, to lead a company, you need to be seen to be doing that. You can't be laid back. You can't be someone who just you know, delegates that leadership out to everybody else and, and isn't rolling up your sleeves and becoming you know, hugely involved with it. Um, and another person I've had uh, you know, great, uh, a great joy in, in working with, Kathleen will know him, uh, Mike Smith is his name. Um, Mike was the CEO of HSBC in Asia for a number of years, and, and he did something which no one had ever done before at his level. He was a group general manager, one of our international management staff. He'd been 30 years with HSBC. You know, when, when you cut Mike's finger, little red hexagons came out. Um, it was just that, that, sort of, that sort of guy. And at age 50, he quit. And he went to, uh, to ANZ Bank to, to start up something which he thought, well not start up, but to take over something which he thought had, had great perspective and great opportunity, actually. One of the reasons he did that is he, is he, is he, he saw, he loves Asia, he's an Asia father, and he saw the opportunity that would be Asia over the next 10 or 20 years of his career span. And so, you know, everywhere now around Hong Kong, no surprise to me, I'm seeing, you know, ANZ, we live in your world. How close is that to the world's local bank? Pretty close, I think. Where do you see his signs? Jardine's Lookout, The Peak, down in Central. You know, he's, he's trying to, to take what he's learned from a previous experience and apply it to a new organization to him. But with all, all of that stuff that was carried around from an acquisition in the US that, that didn't work. So he sees this as a great opportunity. Um, and I know for a fact that a lot of people are following him into that, into that uh, organization because of the dynamism of his leadership. People, people believe and trust him and he executes against them. And you often find that. Great leaders move on, the teams move with them. There's a, there's a private bank here in, in Hong Kong, um, Bankers and Queen, Coots. They lost uh, their head of private banking in uh, Singapore about four months ago. Um, since then, they've lost 90 private bankers in Singapore to go with this fellow, to his new employer, which is not a brand name company he's gone to. So there's this whole notion of loyalty which comes along with this strength of leadership um, in, in organizations. 
building relationships and working with others. You know, it's a team game. It's that whole piece that I mentioned before about deflecting the, the, the success that we have in our organization. The leaders that I got most out of, the most enjoyment from, boy, did they do that well. Um, <laughs> I worked with a fellow in, in Canada, uh, he be, uh, Bill Dalton was his name. Uh, Bill became, uh, Bill's from Weyburn, Saskatchewan. Put a little, put a little background on it. And he, uh, he went to UBC, he did an MBA, he went to McGill. He <coughs> did go to Ivan, that's probably his problem. I'm not sure, I'm not sure about that. And anyway, uh, after he'd been in, in Canada running the bank there for a while, he then went to the UK and he ran the bank as the CEO. Before he, uh, before he left, we, were, we had an executive team meeting and, and we, were, we had this period of time when, when things weren't going quite so well. We had some earnings challenges and, and Bill had this wonderful sense of humor about him and he said, you know, I just want everyone in the room to know that if I go down, I'm taking a lot of you with me. <laughs> and there's this, you know, everyone knew that it was, it was done in fun. But a little bit of an edge at, at, the end of the, uh, at the end of the night. But this whole thing of building relationships and working with others is, is very important. Ability to adapt and, and have interpersonal sensitivity is also uh, very important. Interpersonal. Um, you more and more now, integrity is becoming such an important part of leadership. Uh, in fact, in, in, a, in a YouTube clip, if you, you can log on to it, uh, you'll see that Warren Buffett talked to a, uh, a group of University of Florida students uh, about this time last year. And, uh, and in his very Buffett-like, down-home, folksy way, he was talking about the same sort of thing we're talking about here, what it takes to succeed. And, and he said it's really only three things in his, in his simple mind. You know, the first is you have to have the intellect, uh, which evidently, just by being in the room, you, know, you qualify on that score. Uh, the second thing is you have to have the energy and uh, you know most people at, at this age, at your age, have an abundance of energy. So you've got two out of two so far. He said the third thing is their integrity quotient. You know, do they actually behave in a way that can be trusted and is and is consistent over time? Uh, I, I, a little clip worth worth watching. It takes six or seven minutes to watch, um, but it's this whole notion of how critical integrity is becoming. We're seeing all kinds of institutions get themselves into trouble because at some point in their structure, um, sometimes at very senior levels, people aren't operating at a level of high level of integrity or, or morality. So more and more, shareholders will reward you if you can operate highly at this level and they will punish you if you don't. And so your organization. Uh, resilience. You know, it takes a lot of effort sometimes to get things done in organizations. We talked about that whole bureaucracy and policy piece earlier on, the Harvard study. I, I, you know, you don't become a CEO in a day. It does take some hard yards. It takes some, um, you know, eight knocks to, uh, to, to, to fall down and, and nine times to get up. You know, the ability to just continue to, to show up and to give it a, best, a, a good effort, best effort every day. And to just uh, see through the tough times is oftentimes what it takes to get to the top. One of the, one of the characteristics. Um, when we do assessment centers, which I, which I do with some organizations, um, you can actually get really clear on people's resilience when you, when you see them in group settings and you see folks that just sort of step back and they don't continue to drive and force forward an agenda. Those are the ones that you say, well, maybe we put them down to tier two rather than tier one. Uh, and lastly, personal drive and ambition. Boy, the number of, of people that, um, that in my role here, we had 21 countries and 60,000 employees in Asia for HSBC. Uh, the number of people who are now CEOs who came into my office five, six, seven years ago and would leave me with a message around something like, I want to be a CEO more than life itself. Uh, they're the ones who got it. I mean, our CEO in, in Indonesia uh, is exactly a, a person who, who made that very statement. The fellow who's now in, in, in uh, India, who used to be in Australia, the CEO, same thing. Uh, they just really, really want to succeed. It's just a burning hot fire in their belly that this is their, their calling. This is what they feel they've been put on the, uh, on the planet to do. So they have a very strong desire to succeed. So that's just kind of a, a quick overview of what it might take for you to succeed. Um, Fortunately for me, because I enjoy doing it, um, I get chances to stand in front of groups of people like you and to speak and tell a little bit of the, the, of the story, my single story. And I always worry that people will leave 
thinking, well, that was an interesting half an hour or one hour or whatever the time frame was, but nothing changes. It's just, it, it can be an entertaining hour. What I want you to do here is I'm going to show a little video clip, okay? And at the end, I'm going to ask you a question, okay? So let's, let's show the clip. Kathleen, if you can. difference. 
And if we can, like that young man, become aware of that gift, we gain, through the strength of our visions, the power to shape the future. And that is your challenge. That is my challenge. We must each find our starfish. And if we throw our stars wisely and well, I have no questions, but the 21st century is going to be a wonderful place. Remember, vision without action is merely a dream. Action without vision just passes the time. Vision with action can change the world. something with this and that in a in a in a true coach like fashion I would leave you with a, a challenge or, or that somehow you would do something with this. And that sat challenge that I would throw out to you is to just simply send your a note yourself a note right now on your Blackberry or your iPhone or write down on a pad of paper what one or maybe two things might you do as a result of having heard this this, this session here. It could be around any of the competencies competencies we talked about. It could be around any of the stuff to do with, with the Harvard piece. It could do with you know, Ivy uh, itself. So just take a moment and if you'd write one or two little things or recall one or two little things to yourself that you might be different. minutes for some questions. If you have some questions you would like to ask uh, Steve or if there's others that you would like to ask questions of, please. Steve, Linda or Laura. Um, I'm just sort of wondering with the research that's been done, um, what has been the impact on Generation Y? Do they buy into all of this stuff? Oh, what a great question. Mm -hmm. Do you have kids? No. Well, I'm sure everybody will have a view on this, so I'll, I'll give you my, my view. Um, I mean, the generation coming through is, I guess, the first generation that has um, been exposed to the internet in the way in which they have. They're the first generation that are having to deal with some of the issues that, that my generation has has created for them, you know, social concerns, uh, environmental concerns. Uh, I think they're the first generation that um, is starting to show up to work as independent contractors. And that's the mindset, as opposed to blind loyalty for 35 years and get the gold watch and, and all will be well when you hit the, uh, the golf ball in St. Petersburg. Um, so I, I think they are different. You know, and I think that this whole focus on you know, going back to the Harvard piece around recognition, around advancement, around personal growth, um, is is becoming more and more critical. Um, it's interesting, um, and again, just a personal story. Uh, my daughter, I have two daughters, uh, they're now um, 28 and 30. Um, they traveled with us as, as, you know, my career evolved and we moved overseas and did all that stuff. And for the last 11 years we've been in Hong Kong, they've been in Vancouver. Neither one of them have chosen the corporate route. And something in me says that they observed what, what that was all about, and they wanted not to repeat that. Not that it was a bad experience, but it was, it was not the one that they would choose for themselves. So I just think that the notion that those of us who are of kind of my generation think about in terms of work is not the notion which the new generation workforce is coming in with. I think it's this whole independent contractor mindset, which is uh, which is the difference. And giving themselves flexibility too, flexibility. you know, in terms of their work-life choices. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. 
which adds more complexity to the challenge for organizations to grow. Excellent. Yes. I'm late, sorry. But uh, I would think uh, most probably, you look at the uh, what generation, Y generation, from our point of view, I guess I'm pretty old. So try to look at them from their point of view. I, I believe the core values have not changed. But the expression, the environments that they encounter, mm -hmm. the relationship, the definition of relationship with people, with corporations, and has clearly changed because they're used to the internet, they're connecting with everybody 24 hours a day. Uh, they, if they need attention, they just, you know, click on the web and, you know, they really got responses from thousands of people. So, naturally, if I would be in that kind of situation, I, I would also change my conception. At least I behave differently, but I, I believe the core values mm -hmm. may not have changed that much. Otherwise, we we have no hope for it. <laughs> I think we have to adapt. You know, it's, it's, I'm optimistic that we will. But okay, it's, 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 we have no choice. <laughs> but it, it's different than what it was than it over the last sort of generation of time. It's going to be different. Yeah, but remember when... I, we I think we could spend days on Gen Y. I mean, I think that's an area, and we actually do spend days on Gen Y. So I think you, the more you read about it, the more you find there are very interesting issues on there. Are there other questions that you've got around the, the career side? What I will say is um, there are many, many organizations who are going through formal assessments of their employees, of the, of the dimension which I've touched on here, and the capabilities which I've referenced here, from you know, hospital authorities to railroads to banks to trading companies to real estate firms. Um, and so you know, the stuff that you've seen up here is, is real life. Uh, at some point, you may find yourself being assessed against this criteria itself. And decisions actually do get made on the basis of people's ability to perform against that, uh, those dimensions. The very last point I, was ma I would make is that uh, it, it's, it's kind of like a wheel. There were four dimensions uh, that I, that I down showed up there in the human scope slide. Um, you can have you know, one or two of those dimensions which are hugely inflated and, and very, very full. But if you have one or two of the other dimensions which are flat, if you think about that as a rolling wheel, it's going to be a real bumpy ride. So, you know, I would rather work with an executive that has symmetry and, and not complete inflation than to have, you know, incomplete or, or disproportionate inflation on that on that wheel. So you can't just focus on one or two of those dimensions. It's the whole piece, and that goes back to Kathleen's earlier comment about the Ivy program and focusing on not just HR or finance or it's the whole general management piece, which I think is, is the challenge. That's it for me. Okay. Thank you very much, Steve. It's always a pleasure right. to have you here. Thanks you did a wonderful job. Is this a degree? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very small one for you to see. Mini degree. It's one made Thank just you. for you, Steve. Nobody else can have that particular one. <laughs> Um, there's always a challenge in measuring intelligence, um, in knowing to what extent is it the test, the testing um, process or methodology, and to what extent is it really a reflection of intelligence. Um, so some people are good at taking tests, or right? so people may not be good at taking tests, but quite intelligent, quite right. Um, maybe even good at problem solving. Um, what are the challenges you face in doing these kind of measurements um, of leadership, of, of, of all around skills, everything that you've talked about? The yeah. four Typically, how, how, they're, uh, how they're assessed is in uh, two day, one or two day assessment centers. And there's usually six to eight people who are, who are given a case that they need to work through. <coughs> it's typically not a case that's in their industry. So, you know, if you're in the, working in a hospital, you might be given a case that's in a, in, a, in a social sector, but maybe something like a railroad, for example. Or if you're in a bank, you might be given a retail case, something where you need to think outside the box, but it's somewhat aligned. 
Um, and then it's it's hugely interactive. I mean, there's meetings that people attend. There's there's uh, interviews. There are crisis management situations. You know, you're you're given a situation perhaps where you know the press show up and you have to perform in front of the press. Um, you know, sometimes some companies bring in professional actors to act out uh, scenarios. Um, so there's there's a whole host of, of of um, assessment capability or assessment process, which isn't just about intelligence testing. It's about how do you apply and adapt, and then how quickly do you move it. Part of that has to be kind of traditional. Myers Briggs are, are Myers -Briggs. part of that. Um, yeah. Another company here, SHL, has something called an occupational personality questionnaire, which gives you some some attributes. But it's 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 really the aspiration to to assess the whole rather than just the intellectual capability. And I think always the issue with the testing vehicles is that an over-reliance on one vehicle. Mm -hmm. So you do the MBTI, the Myers-Briggs on somebody, and you say, aha, you're, a, yeah. you know, you're an ENTJ, therefore. And very, very dangerous. So mm -hmm. I think the type of testing that Steve's talking about is much more comprehensive. Yeah. Having the opportunity to talk to people, see how they respond, put them in situations, how do they respond. Very difficult to measure intelligence all by itself, very difficult to measure sort of how you're going to interact with people just by watching you in one situation too. So that's wonderful. If there's more questions, you'll be around for a few minutes. Um, if you have any uh, questions on the EMBA course, I would encourage you to attend an executive MBA program. There is a sheet that was given to you today if you would like to attend the class this weekend. We encourage people to come in and see how the program is run. I think it's the most valuable way to see if it's right for you. Amelia Chan, who you met on the, EM, and on the way in, is a Director of External Relations and Admissions for the EMBA program. She would be happy to talk to you as well. And any other information on uh, Tate Human Capital? Or Tate is certainly, uh, uh, Tate, yeah, Tate, not Steve anymore. No, it's Tate, yeah. uh, Steve Tate is, is, will be here for a few more minutes. So thank you very much for your attendance. I hope that you gained just one thing that will cause you to do something differently starting today.